start our recording. So welcome everybody. Um, welcome Girl Scouts from mostly from Colorado and a few girls from other parts of the country. Thank you so much for joining us today for our first Meet an Expert webinar series. My name is Amy and I'm our Community Partnerships Manager for Girl Scouts of Colorado. Before we dive in, I do want to take care of a few housekeeping items. Um, so first of all, we are going to keep everybody on mute for the duration of today's webinar, and we will be using the chat box to engage and take questions. Um, we're going to try to get everyone's questions answered um, a little bit later on in our webinar. Um, I also really want to emphasize to please make sure that you're using the chat box for questions and commentary about the webinar. Um, please don't enter in other text. Um, if people are continually entering other things into the webinar that are not related to the content today, we will have to remove you from the webinar. Um, additionally, we are recording today's webinar so that anybody um, who wasn't able to join us today can listen in after today's webinar. So we will post it to our YouTube account and then post a link to our website. So please feel free to share um, to share the link out with folks who weren't able to join us today. So all of that given being said, I hope folks can see my screen. Um, you should be able to see my screen. If someone could confirm that you can see my screen in the chat box, that would be great. You should see our Meet an Expert webinar series with a photo of our awesome co-host today. Great, okay. So we're going to first dive in with the Girl Scout Promise in Law. So please join in from home. Um, we'll start with our Girl Scout promise. So, on my honor, I will try to serve God and my country, to help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout law. Now, the Girl Scout law. I will do my best to be honest and fair, friendly and helpful, considerate and caring, courageous and strong, and responsible for what I say and do, and to respect myself and others, respect authority, use resources wisely, make the world a better place, and be a sister to every Girl Scout. All right, well done, everybody. Um, so now I'm very excited to welcome our expert for today, Judge Julie Hoskins, who is a district judge for the 19th Judicial District of Colorado. There are 22 judicial districts in our wonderful state of Colorado, and the 19th district covers and serves Weld County. Um, so Judge Hoskins is going to um, teach us a little bit about government and our, the judicial branch of our government. Um, and then after she presents, we will um, be taking questions from the chat box. So um, please enter your questions there and, uh, and take it away, Judge Hoskins. And now I'm unmuted, okay. <laughs> See, she has all of the control. And sometimes people feel like that's what judges have, but it's not quite true. So I'm gonna walk you through this a little bit. So my name is Julie Hoskins and I am a district court judge and I've been on the bench. I've been a district court judge um, longer than probably, well, than all of you have been alive. So, in fact, I had my youngest, who's a daughter, when I was already on the bench. Uh, so I've been a judge for a while. So the context for this is for you to visit a branch of government. And so I am gonna walk around and give you a little tour of my space here. And so what you're visiting today is the judicial branch. The judicial branch is often referred to as the third branch of government. And sometimes there's some confusion about what the judicial branch does. The legislative branch, as I'm sure you all know, writes the laws, writes what the speed limit should be, writes that you can't steal things, writes what the punishment is if you do steal things. So again, the legislature writes all of the laws. The executive branch, that's the president, the, govern, uh, the governor, prosecutors, police, that's the executive branch, they enforce the law. And so most people can pretty easily wrap their head around law enforcement. Again, police officers writing tickets or arresting people who are accused of violating the law. The judicial branch, and that's me and my fellow judges, we apply the law. And so what that means is 
we take whatever is brought before us and we apply what the legislature has written. For example, um, let's say somebody is accused of stealing a car, and so they're arrested for that. Um, the first thing that I do as a judge is advise that person of his or her rights. And a lot of you know these rights from watching TV. Um, you have the right to remain silent. You have the right to have an attorney. Um, you have the right to have a jury trial. And so again, that's kind of the first thing that I do and again, we'll start with a criminal case, but when somebody gets arrested for um, committing a crime, um, the next step, again, if we're talking about a criminal case would be what we call a preliminary hearing. And that means we have kind of a short hearing about whether there's enough evidence to have the person go to trial. And so I don't get to hear all the evidence at that time, the defendant doesn't get to testify. And the court, the burden, so we have burdens of proof at every level, and those again are set by the legislature. So at the preliminary hearing, that's just uh, by a preponderance of evidence. So do I think it's more likely than not that the person committed the crime? If I do find that it's more likely than not that they committed the crime, then the case may be set for trial. Um, and if I find that there's not enough evidence to have the person stand for trial, then I dismiss the case at that point. And that doesn't happen very often, but it does happen sometimes. Um, at trial, the burden's completely different. At trial, the burden is the district attorney has to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury and we say it's a jury of the defendant's peers, so people from the community. Um, and so that's a very different burden, it's a, the highest burden. Um, and at any time, there could be a plea agreement, and that just means that, again, the executive branch, the prosecutor, and the defendant have made an agreement as to what the defendant's gonna plead guilty to and what the consequences will be. And so again, as a judge, when we talk about me applying the law, um, sometimes it's very easy and there's not really any choice. Uh, for example, if somebody commits the crime of first degree murder, very serious charge, there's only one sentence that I can give that person and that is to sentence them to prison without ever being released. But let's say it's another, pretty much any other crime. Let's say someone threatens somebody with a knife. That set of circumstances, the legislature has said, as a judge, you can sentence the person to one year to three years of prison. And so again, my job in applying the law is to decide what that sentence should be or whether the person should stay in the community and be subject to reporting to a probation officer or have to do useful public service hours or have to do some sort of rehabilitation. Um, and I know there's a lot of chats and I see somebody with their hand up. Um, <laughs> yes, life is a lot of years. Um, and so again, at trial, if the person is found not guilty, then the case is dismissed and the person has, the defendant doesn't have any other things that they have to do with um, the court. And so that's kind of how criminal works. And again, uh, and I see somebody's mom is a probation officer and we work a lot with probation officers. And so criminal is just one thing that judges do. So we have to apply the law in every area. So for example, another type of case that I have right now is what we call mental health holds. So sometimes people may have a mental illness. And so again, in applying the law, I have to decide whether they have to stay in a facility or whether they have to take medication or if they can be released. And so again, the legislature kind of tells me what I need to look at and consider in making those decisions. Um, family law, all of you have families, right? And sometimes parents stay together, sometimes they don't. And so if parents don't stay together, then again, the judge as part of the judicial branch has to apply the law to make decisions. Like how often should the children see each parent? 
or how um, how should the house be divided or the pets or the pots and pans. And so again, the legislature gives us the statutes that we have to rely upon and consider different things, but then we have to make the decision applying the law as to what actually happens in any case. Again, the judicial branch, so where I am is a trial court, and so I'm making those initial decisions. If someone disagrees with the outcome, with what my decision is, or says that I didn't apply the law correctly, then they can appeal the case. And here that would go to the Colorado Court of Appeals. And so that's kind of the next level. Um, if the Court of Appeals says that I did everything right, then that's usually the end of it. Although sometimes in the other, the side who appealed in the first place may try to have the Supreme Court um, review it, but the Supreme Court doesn't review very many cases. Um, and they get to decide for the most part which cases they review or not. Um, and again, it's the legislature that kind of sets the bounds in terms of what the burden of proof is. Again, we talked about a criminal case. It has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, other cases such as when I was talking about mental health cases, those it's by clear and convincing evidence or if the government um, sometimes feels that children aren't safe in their homes and so Social services may ask the court to allow the removal of a child. And so that burden of proof is also clear and convincing evidence. So it's a, it's, um, it has to be quite a bit of proof. Um, I'm going to walk around the courtroom just a little bit so you can see what the setup looks like. And so I'm at my bench right now, and you can see behind me is the Colorado flag and the um, United States flag. And then there's also the Colorado seal. And so that, again, by the legislature is required to be in each courtroom. And so let me see. Okay, so here's the view that I have. And so right in front of me where you see a plant is where a court reporter sits. And so she takes down everything that's said during the trial or during the proceedings. Here, I'm standing in front of the jury box. And we usually have 12 people who um, serve for any jury. And then moving away from the jury box, let's see. All right. So let me do this this way. So. To my right is where the district attorney sits. And so these are always public proceedings. And so in the back is the gallery and that's where any observers would sit. And then this side is where the defendant sits. And then if I turn around, there's the podium looking back up to the bench. So you can see where the flags are. And then I'm sitting up there. All right, and so I will go back to the bench. All right. So I think, Amy, if it's okay, we can start some discussions or answer some questions. Do you want yeah. to? Great. Um, so I can go through the chat box and kind of monitor some of the questions that are coming through. So I'm just bear with me because I'm going to scroll up a little bit. Um, so somebody asked, um, we'll start here because I think you asked a few, you answered a few of these questions. So somebody asked on a scale of one to 10, how on average, how hard is it to remain indifferent? One being very easy and 10 being very hard. I would say it tends to be around one or two. And that's just because of how I approach things and how I approach life. Um, being a judge is something that you shouldn't do if you have a hard time being able to step back and kind of take an objective look. And so again, first and foremost, my job is to apply the law. And the only way I can apply the law is if I treat everyone fairly and I don't let 
how I might feel about a particular thing affect my decision. And so for me, it's generally not a difficult thing to remain impartial because it's just so ingrained in, in what I do and what my job requires me to do. Great. Okay, I'm gonna keep going through to these questions. Um, what kinds of classes did you have to take in college and I guess in law school to become a judge? Okay, so every state is different in terms of qualification. So Colorado, to be a district court judge, you have to um, have been practicing at least five years and have a law degree and pass the bar. Um, so in terms of the type of classes, I would say for your undergraduate degree, it generally doesn't matter so much what that degree's in. Certainly there are things that are helpful, like English would be helpful. Um, a lot of law school students have a background in political science, but kind of my experience is that the type of classes matters much less than ultimately your passion for the classes and how you do. In terms of then law school, law school is generally another three years after college. So that's a total of seven years after high school, although that may be changing some, but um, how it stands right now, it's usually seven years after high school. And again, it depends on what you want to do. There's not really classes that you can take to be a judge, um, but there are certainly classes that you can take to practice law in an area that you find interesting because there's so many different things. There's criminal law, like I talked about. There's family law. There's environmental law. There's transactional law where people are never in a courtroom. Um, and so they're just, I mean, ultimately you take what you're interested in. All right, great. Okay, so there's there's some doozy questions in this in these chat boxes. I see a lot of messages, but I'm still trying to work our way through the beginning. So somebody asked, how do you make a law? And I think that that's a doozy of a question, but can you give us maybe a short and sweet answer? Again, so usually somebody will approach their local legislature, whether it's somebody in the House of Representatives or their senator, and say, hey, I have this idea that I think we need to do. Um, I will come up with something that's just happened very recently. So this past legislative session, um, the laws around escaping, being on escape status changed tremendously and so Basically, somebody saw that felt that there was a problem of there being too many people in jail when they walked away from work release or walked away from the halfway house. And so the legislature, with input from their local constituents, so the people who voted for them, decided to, instead of making it one of the most serious crimes, a class three felony, and so you could go to prison for four to 12 years, decided to make it a class three misdemeanor, which means the most you could go to jail is six months. So six months versus 12 years. And so again, that's because somebody went to their local legislature, or this was a situation where I think a lot of people were feeling, we just have too many people in jail. What's the way to release people who maybe wouldn't be harmful to the rest of the community? And so that is the way that law developed. And again, they get in from all sorts of people. Great, thank you. That was a good, that's a great answer. I'm, I'm happy to uh, have an example. It's always easier to understand things that way. Um, okay. So I'm gonna try to kind of go through these questions and say, so here's a great question. Is it hard to be a judge? I mean, I know you said on a scale of one to 10, it wasn't that difficult to remain impartial, but overall, do you feel it's challenging? There are things that are very challenging and there are things that are less challenging. I saw one of the questions was, have I ever sent a teen to jail? Um, yes, I've sent teens and for my courtroom, they have to be adults. So teens would be 18 or 19 year olds. I did previously have, um, 
a juvenile delinquency docket, and this was many years ago, again, before any of you were born, this was around 2003, and so anyone that I sent to jail would have been a teen. But I, um, for example, an 18 or 19 year old, if there's really, if it's such a serious crime, or they've already been through the juvenile prison sentence, then I end up sending them to prison. And that's always hard. Um, I have three kids myself. Two of them are fairly young. There's a 21 year old and a 23 year old. And when I'm sentencing someone who is my children's age to prison, that's always kind of hard because prison is not someplace that anyone should ever want to be. It's absolutely necessary for a lot of people. Um, but it means that things haven't turned out in that person's life like they would have wanted or like their parents would have wanted. So sure. I'm gonna plug in my, okay. Sorry, my computer is telling me my internet was unstable. So now I'm plugged in and no longer wireless, so we should be good. Great, Thank All you. right, um, so those things are hard. Well, I was gonna say, and another thing that can be hard, um, so when you have jury trials, a lot of times they're for the cases that are very, very difficult. Some cases are very easy to resolve. For example, if somebody shoplifts from Walmart and it's on the video, then that case resolves pretty easily. But a lot of cases are about one person says one thing and another person says another thing, or someone gets, very, gets really hurt. Um, and sometimes the impact on the jury, who ultimately is deciding whether somebody is guilty or not, is really hard on them. And that's one of those things that is really hard sometimes on me, is kind of seeing their reactions. Because I'm used to seeing a lot of these things and it doesn't always register with me um, how it's going to affect other people. And so again, feeling kind of feeling what other people are going through because you do have to have empathy. It doesn't mean that you take everything home with you, but you have to absolutely be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And sometimes that's very hard. Sure. Okay. Um, okay, there's a lot of messages here, so I'm still trying to work our way back. Do you enjoy being a judge? I do, I absolutely love it. I, could not ask for a better job for myself. I really like working with people and feeling like I may be able to make a difference or at least help people understand that they were heard and that their concerns were listened to, whether that's a mom or a dad in a divorce case or the defendant or a victim in a criminal case. Um, but part of my job is really to hear and listen to everyone and weigh that and then apply the tools that the legislature has given me. And I do, I thoroughly enjoy that. Great. Um, can you explain to us a little bit about how the districts work and kind of how the state is split up? Sure, so you touched on that. So there are 22 judicial districts. There are far more counties than there are districts. There are a few districts that are one county and Weld County is one of those, so the 19th Judicial District is just Weld County. Where Fort Collins is, um, I believe that's the 18th, there are two counties. So it's Jackson County, where Walden is, and Larimer County. Um, Denver is just one county. Um, Jefferson County is just one county, I believe, yes. Um, but some districts have five or six counties, especially when you're talking about on the Eastern Plains or mm -hmm. in the Southwest corner of the state. And your district court judges see over the whole district. And then there's county court judges, which are kind of a step down. They hear less serious criminal cases than I hear. And they can't do family law or adoptions or any of those kind of cases. Um, and so each county has to have a judge, although some of the very small counties that don't have very many people just have a part-time judge. And many times that part-time judge does not have to be a lawyer. Um, there, the number of districts can expand. And in fact, it did expand about five or six years ago when um, Broomfield 
and part of Adams became a district. And so just because we have 22 districts today, doesn't mean that that's what it will always be. Sure. Um, this question came up. So what has changed in the judicial system um, because of COVID-19 and how are things uh, continuing to sure. operate? Well, first thing that we did was try to clear out as many people from jail and work release that we possibly could because we knew those would be hot spots. Um, I don't think at least in Well County that anyone from prison was released because of COVID-19, but we definitely released a lot of people from jail. Right now, we're doing everything by video. So in the courtroom, um, like today I had cases all day up until about three o'clock. And at most, well, there was one case where I had a couple people, family members who were supporting um, the defendant. So at most we had eight people. Before COVID-19, I might have 60 people in the courtroom. Um, wow. But the attorneys are appearing by telephone, the defendants are appearing by video, some attorneys are appearing by video, and more often than not, there's only three or four of us in the courtroom. Again, where usually I would say there would be at least 10 of us. Um, it really slows things down because it just takes longer to do everything by video and we're not passing papers back and forth. I used to get the plea paperwork from the attorneys and I would read it and go over it with the defendant who is right in front of me. And now I'm relying on questions to the attorney. So attorney, did you read your client all of his rights? And then I go over those rights with the client to make sure that he or she understands exactly what they're doing Whereas again, if I have the piece of paper with their signature, it goes a lot faster. Um, and so I also preside over DUI court. I know I've seen some DUI questions. Um, if somebody has four or more DUIs, then they're eligible for the DUI court. And so that's a treatment court and we meet every other week. And so now that's done by video. And again, that used to be, we were all in the courtroom and you lose something, but, and a DUI is driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And so. Thank you for answering those. Okay. All right. We're still, so um, how many hours a day do you work? Like, what does your, what does your day look like on a Monday? So on a Monday, um, I'm usually prepared for it, hopefully Friday afternoon. But Monday would be sentencings or hearings on um, whether somebody's constitutional rights were violated when they were arrested or when their house was searched or when their um, car was searched. I usually take the, I'm usually sitting here right where I am right now on my bench from about 8.30 and we go until about noon. And then we usually start up in the afternoon about 1.30 and go to about five. Now that's not necessarily how long I work um, because you have to prepare your cases, you have to read pre-sentence reports if you're sentencing somebody, and on jury trials, uh, when I have a jury trial, which is another thing that we don't have with COVID-19 because we can't bring enough people into the courtroom. So all jury trials are suspended right now. Um, but when I have a jury trial, those tend to be very, very long days. I mean, those are usually mm -hmm. 10, 11, sometimes 12 hour days, just because the entire time I'm on the bench, I'm, I'm only doing the one case. And that doesn't mean other cases aren't getting filed or that other cases don't need me to do something on them. So I have to do that outside of my regular work hours. Thank you. I'm just going to pause here for a moment and remind everybody to please keep the chat box only for questions um, for our guest. Um, we are trying to work through all the questions, but when they're being repeatedly entered into the chat box, it's hard to kind of, it's hard to go back through. Um, additionally, I'm going to ask anybody to please stop drawing on our presentation. Um, I'm going to just remove everybody from uh, what's been drawn on here. Um, I just want to make sure everybody respects um, each other as Girl Scouts and respects our time here together. 
Um, so if you just give me a moment here. And I actually was a Girl Scout <laughs> a very long time ago. <laughs> I love it. Okay, let me get my chat box back here. Give me a moment. Oh. Okay, back to the chat box. And additionally, if folks are going to continue answering or entering information into the chat box that's not a question for our guests, we will remove you from the webinar. So please just um, really want to emphasize that we're trying to get through everyone's questions as best we can. So there was an easy one, and I, well, the state seal. It's right behind me, but you're right. The lighting is not good. Oh. Um, and I don't think I can take it down. I can, I'm afraid if I untether myself that I'm going to lose my connection because <laughs> my computer doesn't like to go back and forth. But you can definitely Google it on the uh, internet and see what the seal looks like. Great. And maybe, um, so like I said, mentioned before, we're recording today's webinar. We'll send a link out to everyone um, who signed up just in case anybody couldn't join or they had any technical difficulties. And maybe I'll include a link to a picture so that folks can get um, a good up close look. Um, okay, can you explain to us a little bit between the difference between jail and prison? Sure. So jail is going to be in your local county and it's, generally people kind of going in and out. They could be sentenced to jail, and that would usually be for what's called a misdemeanor charge, and so not a terribly serious charge. Um, people sit in jail, sometimes if they cannot bond out, and they're waiting for their case to go to trial or to otherwise be resolved. Prison is only for when you've been sentenced there. And so, and it's also only for felonies. And so you have to face a much serious, much more serious charge in the first place to be sentenced to prison. Prisons are run by the executive branch, as are jails, but prisons, once I send somebody to the Department of Corrections, which is prison, then I have no ability to have any control over what happens to that person. So the Department of Corrections or prison decides, does that person go to Sterling? Does that person go to Canyon City? Um, there are various prisons around the state. And so when somebody is sent to prison, prison kind of assesses um, how dangerous the person is, and that determines where the person is placed. Whereas again, jail is more of just a holding facility while people are waiting for their cases to be resolved. Or if it's a misdemeanor case, they might be sentenced um, to jail time. And Sterling is just, it's out east of here and it's just the name of one of the um, prisons, just like when I was saying Canyon City. So they're just different prisons. Great. Um, this person's asked this question a few times. So what's the most important thing that helped you become a judge? I think maybe in like your whole life. Um, I think just having a passion for the law and also for people and really wanting people to have the best outcomes that are possible. Um, some of the things that you see as a judge can be absolutely horrific and there's just not a good way to, you can't fix things. Um, if someone's um, child gets killed in a car accident, I can't bring that child back to life, right? But what I can do is make sure that the process is as fair as possible and that people are treated with respect and ultimately that the laws are applied fairly and across the board so that, again, both sides, the person accused of the, causing the car accident as well as the parents of the child, understand and feel that they were her and that I did my job right. They may not agree with what I ultimately decide. Um, in fact, it's very unusual for everyone to be happy with anything that I decide because everybody has competing interests. Um, each side wants different things. Um, but ultimately, it's, um, again, I think having a passion for people and having a passion 
really for justice and fairness is what helps the most. Um, okay, so here's a great question. Um, is it scary sometimes to be a judge? Um, that's an interesting question. It kind of depends on what type of cases I have. And I know this answer is probably going to be a little unusual. When I have the docket that I have now and I'm dealing with criminal cases and people accused of felonies, then it's usually not scary. And the reason it's not scary is because those people are usually on their best behavior and they're trying to impress me. They want me to think that they're a good person or that they understand that they're in trouble and they're taking responsibility. And so I can honestly say that I've never had any real concerns from anyone who appears in front of me um, as a defendant or the defendant's family. And I work very close to where I live and I usually walk home or I bike to work and bike home. And so I'm out and about a lot. And so I often will have people that I've sent to prison flag me down and say, hey, Judge Hoskins, <laughs> I'm out and I'm doing really well. And so again, the criminal cases aren't scary. The ones that tend to be a little bit scary sometimes because people are not usually behaving at their best are when I'm doing divorce cases. Because those people oftentimes um, don't, they're not at their best. They're not trying to impress me. They're trying to get at the other person. And many times they take it very personally if you rule against them and they think mm. somehow you're part of the ex's side and just kind of um, generally when judges do get hurt or threatened by someone, it's usually from a domestic relations or a divorce kind of case as opposed to a criminal kind of case. And so sometimes that can be a little scary, a little uncomfortable especially if people are still very, very upset and I have to walk past them to leave the building. Mm. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, so somebody asked, can you tell us what does it look like? Do you work with other judges? And like, how do you collaborate with them if you do? So we generally don't collaborate, although if I'm really stuck on something, then I might reach out to somebody and say, here's kind of how I'm looking at this, here's the law that I think applies, um, what are your thoughts? And certainly sometimes some of my colleagues, my fellow judges do that with me. Um, ultimately, again, part of my job, part of what the Constitution requires me to do is come to my own conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so again, I might bounce some things off, but I ultimately have to decide what do I think is required under a set of circumstances. So there are 11 of us district court judges here in Weld County. And again, we, we do sometimes talk to each other about cases, but we don't ever say, well, what would you do? Or tell me what I should do. Um, mm -hmm. Because then I'm not using my independent judgment. And so there's not really, there's not collaboration to come up with an answer, but there certainly is collaboration about um, how we might change a process to make it better or how we might change dockets. So a, another COVID-19 thing, at some point we're going to have to have a whole lot of jury trials because we haven't had any in two, two months and we're probably not going to have any next month. And so that is going to require all the judges working together to have judges who might not normally do criminal cases um, do some criminal jury trials because those have a time component that we have to meet. Thank you. Um, okay, so going back to our chat box, um, what do you do if you have a case where somebody doesn't speak English? We have interpreters. Um, we have three um, Spanish speaking interpreters who are here when we're not in our current pandemic, um, who are here full time. Um, so those are Spanish speaking. We have Somali interpreters who often come up from Denver. Um, Burmese who also often come up from Denver. If it's a language that is not as common, 
then they might have to help um, through a telephone, through audio, as opposed to personally being here. Um, and we also have people who are deaf, and so we have sign language interpreters for that. But one of the requirements of the system is that everyone has access. And so if someone needs an interpreter, that will happen. Great, thank you. Um, as a judge, is there somebody who can tell you what to do? Or do you have a boss? <laughs> So that's kind of yes and kind of no. So every district has a chief judge and the chief judge sets the hours. So I have a boss who tells me when I have to be here in the morning and when I can leave, who tells me how many days of vacation I can take. Um, but what he can't do is tell me how to decide a case or tell me, so um, actually he was fine with this, but I don't know if you can see, but I have a purple robe. And so that had to be with the permission of my chief judge and he was fine with that. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some things that I could get in trouble for if I didn't follow, like if I just decided to come in at noon every day, mm -hmm. then I could lose my ability to be a judge. But if I decided to, um, not wear a robe and just wear my clothes, then he can't really tell me that I can't do that. Um, so ultimately my boss or the one who tells me that I get to keep my job or not will be the electors of Weld County. So I do have to stand for a retention election every six years. Wow. Great. Um... Have you ever have to, had to judge um, a member of your family? And how does that work when someone comes in who you have a personal relationship with? So if I have a personal relationship with someone, then I have to do what's called recuse myself, which says I can't touch the case. I can't make any kind of decision on that case. And so one of my colleagues, one of my fellow judges would have to make that decision. And so, um, right, if, if you have a personal relationship with someone, that is one that you feel like you can't be impartial or that people would feel that you might be prejudiced, then you cannot hear or preside on that case. Sure, that makes sense. Okay, um, there are some questions coming in that I think we're actually gonna skip over because I do know we have Girl Scouts of all different ages, so anywhere from kindergarten through high school listening in. So I do wanna make sure that, um, the questions that were being asked are appropriate for all girls listening in. Um, so, mm -hmm. let me see what else. Um, I know, so someone has asked this a few times, um, if you've ever worked on any cases that have to do with pet abuse. I know that Girl Scouts are always very interested in animals. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, and yes. And they're very sad cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just very sad. Um, but the answer is yes, most pet abuse cases are just misdemeanors. And so they would not come before me. But if it's severe enough or involves enough animals or has happened enough times before, then it becomes a felony. And the answer is yes. Then, and yes, I have. And I said, those can be really hard cases. I have two dogs, I love animals, and um, it's always sad to see them mistreated because obviously they can't fend for themselves. Um, somebody asked, this is a great question, what would happen if you got sick? Would someone take your place? It kind of depends. Um, luckily, I have never been sick when I had cases set. And I know somebody asked how long I, I've been a judge. I've been a judge or on the bench since 2003. And I really haven't um, been sick except for one time when I had a different docket, a civil docket. Um, I blew out an eardrum. And luckily, I didn't have any cases set. So it didn't matter that I wasn't really able to come in. What we try to do if somebody is ill unexpectedly is cover their cases. Um, 
And so what will happen is the chief judge will send out an email that day and we see if we can pick it up and cover it. And most of the time we can. Every once in a while, we can get a substitute judge to come in at the last minute. So it would be a retired judge who has a contract to judge a certain amount of days a year. Or worst case, and this certainly is what happens sometimes, everything has to be reset. And so the people who thought they were gonna have their cases heard that day aren't going to. And that's what we try, we try to do everything um, to avoid that. But sometimes if everybody is just in court all day and has a full docket, then that's what has to happen, is um, my staff would have to reset. So. I'm just reminding folks that we, again, we have Girl Scouts of all ages on here. So I'm, I am gonna skip some of the questions that are coming through just to try to keep things um, as appropriate as possible for all the awesome Girl Scouts we have on here. Um, Someone has asked this a few times, so and I don't know what this is. So have you worked with Ralph's Car Justice Center? And I'm not sure what that is. Maybe you do. Okay. So the Ralph Car Justice Center is where the Supreme Court is for Colorado. So it's on Broadway in downtown Denver. And the answer is I don't generally work directly with them. I've certainly been in different trainings with them, but again, that's where the Court of Appeals is, and that's where the Supreme Court is. And so there aren't any trial judges who work there. Again, it's all appellate judges. And so um, we don't really work together because they have to kind of judge my homework, right? They have to judge the decisions that I made in a case and ultimately decide, did I properly apply the law or did I not? And if I didn't, should the case come out differently? Because sometimes it's what we call harmless error, like you make a mistake, but it wouldn't change anything. Um, but sometimes errors aren't harmless, in which case they either have to just reverse what I've done or send it back to me to consider other things. Great, thank you. Um, do you have a favorite type of case that you uh, really enjoy working on? Um, you know, I get asked that question a lot just generally, and the answer is no. Every type of case has different things that are good and things that may be more challenging. So I'm a person who does not like to be in the paper, and with a criminal docket, then many times my decisions and my sentencings do actually end up in the paper. And so that's uncomfortable. Um, family law, I really enjoy working with people and helping make decisions about their children and um, those kind of things. But sometimes when I see them treating their children really poorly, that, that's very frustrating, very hard. And so that makes that docket kind of hard. Although when I'm doing that type of work, I'm never in the paper, right? So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, the civil docket, so that's when people have a contract or um, like a personal injury case when you see the attorneys on TV saying, I represent traffic victims. Um, all of those are civil cases. Well, when you have a civil docket, you're actually not on the bench very much and you're doing a lot of reading and writing. And again, Kind of what I really like to do is work with people and so that's a challenge for me when I have an assignment where I actually don't get to work with people so much and the decisions that I'm making don't feel quite as personal as they might in the domestic relations docket or in the criminal docket. Great. Okay. Um, someone asked this, it wasn't public in the chat box, but what, is there something or a moment that you felt like where you felt inspired to become a judge? You know, I think less a moment. I started becoming, I went on the bench because I absolutely had a passion for juveniles. And so where I started was as the juvenile magistrate. And so a magistrate, instead of being appointed by the governor, like a judge is, a magistrate is appointed by the chief judge and you don't do jury trials. And so my original passion that brought me to the bench was working with kids in truancy cases and in juvenile delinquency cases. 
And so that's, again, what brought me kind of on this path. Okay, so I think we're gonna start to wrap up here. Um, folks, if there were questions that um, you asked that weren't answered in the chat box today, I always recommend go off and do your own research. Remember, you're Girl Scouts. Um, you can go out and seek out some of this knowledge by yourself. Um, I do think, Judge Hoskins, is there anything that you feel like you wanna kind of leave all of us with um, as we wrap things up today? I would um, just say really, whatever your passion is, you know, follow your passion and be prepared that it may take you in different directions that you never thought it would. I did not go to college thinking at some point I would be a judge. Um, never was on the radar at all. And so again, I, I think find what your interests are and figure out how you can make your interests be what you do with your life. And hopefully that works out because it's really great looking forward to going to work on Monday because I know a lot of people don't. And so um, again, just follow your passions and do research and do the best that you can do. I am going to ask you one final question that somebody else asked in the chat box, so I can't take credit for this, but what is your favorite Girl Scout cookie? Oh, <laughs> it's actually extremely boring. I like tree foils and I like to put raspberry <laughs> jam on them. <laughs> that sounds delicious. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. I hope um, all the awesome Girl Scouts out there um, learn something new today um, and maybe Girl Scouts, I always encourage you to go out and share what you learned today with somebody else. Share it with your family, share it with your friends. Um, so thanks so much, everybody. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.